What are your rules for telling a good story? You know, I I think a lot of writers, write, we, we write to entertain ourselves first. I think I watch movies. You know, I've watched movies my entire life and you, you create this encyclopedia in your head of like what speaks to you as an artist and what you go back to time and time again. So I think for me, writing a good story, it always comes down to concept first. What is that 10,000 foot view of an idea and what makes it stand out? That's for me as a creator. And when you, I'm very much about structure. When, when I'm writing with, with Natalie, she's, because she's coming from an actress point of view, she's very much about character, which is completely true that I think you can have a bad movie, but if you have good characters, people are still gonna love it in some ways. But on the flip side, you can have some great characters, but you can have a very bad structure and story and people will tune out. So I think, I think you really have to know your beginning, middle, and end very early on, and that they thematically line up, you know, and that you're 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 saying some kind of message with the story you're telling. You know, you're you're entertaining, but I think as a creator, you also have to have that backbone of why am I telling the story? I think is important. When you're working on a story, how do you know it's developed enough or not developed enough? Yeah, that's tricky. I think it's different for everybody. And I'm, when I write, I, I'm not the fastest writer. Sometimes I am. It's very true. And I say this, I have this conversation with myself all the time. Like, I wish I was faster, but I'm like, but I am fast sometimes. And over the years, you know, I think when you're a young writer, a lot of people just dive into writing a script. And I've always been a, a militant note taker. Like I will write things down on a napkin or, you know, now we have phones. It's a constant notes in my phones about when an idea strikes me. And, you know, eventually you get enough of these ideas, like when you're driving or in the shower and you, you're you kind of ruminating on this, this concept. Because for me, it's always the concept. Like I have a you know, I start with the elevator pitch, essentially. that That's always how I come up with an idea, is I like to tell high-concept stories, at least when I'm writing specs and writing on my own um, or writing with Natalie. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna bring an idea out to the town, I want it to be high-concept. I want someone to be able to get it and be like, oh, that's clever, that's, I get that, oh, it feels fresh. So, I really just simmer in that and, and take all these notes. And then once I feel like I have enough notes in, in the three acts or know, finally know where it's gonna end, I'll do a very detailed treatment, which I, I never used to do. And, and, and I, you know, I'll, if, if anyone's a young writer and doesn't like that structure, I tell them, please write a treatment. You know, because you learn from your mistakes, you know. Oftentimes when you write a script without an outline or a treatment, even a six page document, it doesn't have to be long, as long as you know where you're going, I, I caution them, you probably won't finish the script. You may have a great first act, but you're gonna lose yourself somewhere around act two. So I think in this process of deciding, you know, when's enough, like when do you have developed enough, for me, it's, I have to write the treatment and have every beat almost in there before I'll sit down and write a screenplay now. And that can take months. You know, I may spend three months developing and, and then writing a treatment. But then the script writing process is usually very, very fast because of it and, and making sure it's all there. Because I think when you're, when you know you have a good idea, you have to decide if you have a good movie before you should sit down and write. And, and that's always gonna be a struggle, deciding like, I think you have to have enough on the page and developing. That's when you know enough is enough for me, is that it's all there. <laughs> I have it all and I'm ready to, to sit down and write a screenplay. 
Are there certain things you do to get yourself into a headspace if it's a thriller, if it's more of a fantasy? I mean, writing at a coffee shop, is that really going to get you in the right headspace if it's a psychological thriller with a lot of scares? I'll do, I, I tend not to go to the coffee shop unless I'm struggling. You know, if I'm struggling with something and need a, because I'm, I'm definitely the kind of person, also being an editor, when I'm writing or editing, I will sit in a chair and forget to eat. You know, I'll, I'll, I can sit in a chair for eight hours and work and enjoy that process and not get up, right? So, so if you're hitting your head against a wall, I'd go to a coffee shop and do that just to kind of get yourself out of this bubble. But for me, it's about watching other movies. You know, what, what if I'm writing a movie in a certain genre, I'll watch movies that will inspire me in that genre. And, and I think that's cool. Like you, you, you say that's, I, that's not a waste of time. Like watching movies is part of the process. You know, so it's, if you're, you know, getting up at 10 a.m. to start writing and instead you're putting on that movie, to me, that's the same thing. You know, that's part of the journey. And the other part is finding my playlist, which is a big part of my writing process. Early on, I'll start popping music into a playlist with the name of the movie, and I'll eventually have a whole bunch of music in there, and the, that, that will be the voice of my movie. Either if it's, you know, it can have, dot, it can have lyrics, you know, because sometimes a lot of writers don't like to write with lyrics because it kind of gets in their head, or it will be scores from movies, but I do both, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing a movie that I picture having a lot of contemporary music in it, I'll listen to that music when I'm writing. So that's, that's a big, that gets me into the headspace a lot. Like uh, some examples of the music or artists? I'm just curious. It's different for every movie. I'd say for thrillers and stuff, if I'm writing a, a horror film, I'll tend to find other soundtracks, you know, like, Right now, my wife and I are, are writing a pitch, and I'm listening to the Candyman remake, the music in that movie. A lot. Not a, it's technically a sequel, but <laughs> the latest Candyman film. Uh, I thought it had great music, so I, it's, it, it's in the same vein. You know? And it's also, what are those songs you get, get in your head and let you just completely zone out on the page? You almost don't hear it anymore, but it becomes, it becomes the soundtrack for what you're writing. You worked with Clive Barker when you first came to LA? Yes. Right? Yeah. What are some things that you've kind of infused in your storytelling and filmmaking that's always stayed with you? I think, you know, I, and I worked with Clive, you know, I still keep in touch with Clive, and I worked with Clive, it was almost, you know, between 10 and 12 years. It was a long time that I got to be uh, close to how he did things. I, I wish I could have watched him direct a movie, but that was beyond his directing years. He was he was producing and he was writing his novels, he was painting. But he, you know, listening to the stories of like when they made Candyman and and Hellraiser and learning, you know, if you're if you're making a scary movie, he's like, you have to scare the audience every seven minutes. It sounds so like scientific, but you know, that was a lesson I always remembered. Like don't leave your audience hanging. And, you know, I had watched Candyman when it came out in theaters, you know, years before I ever knew I was gonna meet Clive. And I thought the kinds of movies he makes are very sophisticated in their storytelling, in their character. To me, and I, to me, Candyman's a drama, but it has, you know, it has a, a core love story, it has, very compelling elements of mystery, uh, and it's also terrifying. So I think that's something that I always want to do when I'm making movies, is, is give the audience characters they can love and care about. I've never been interested in making a movie where your characters are disposable, which was a very much a tradition of horror for a long time, and still is in a lot of movies. Like, oh, let me make a bunch of unlikable people so I can slaughter them and the audience will feel all right about it. <laughs> I'm like, well, why, why not make a whole bunch of likable characters that the audience really loves and slaughter them anyways? 
so that the audience has a an emotional reaction to losing something instead of just feeling like okay about it. Those were definitely lessons that I learned from him. I think you dissected or adapted one of his novels and he it wasn't even something he had asked you to do. Well, yeah, I started cuz you know working with Clive and starting like reading all he had this great library of all his books from different countries uh, on the shelf. So I just, I would consume as much of his content as I could. And he wrote this young adult novel called Thief of Always. And it had been at a few studios. It was at Fox and it was at Universal. And, and for some reason, people had a hard time. It never got made and people had a hard time adapting it. And I, you know, I read that book and I was like, well, this is the movie. I, it's The book is so perfect. I don't know why. what's so hard about writing the script. And so so I turned, the first thing I did, and this I was probably there a year or two at the point, I just adapted it into a screenplay and I gave it to him. And it was literally the, I had written in college, but not to the extent of, you kind of, I think as a writer, a young writer, you know, 120 pages sounds like a lot, <laughs> you know, and and I think you have to get over that hump. And Thief of Always was that hump for me. It was just like, okay, well, here's a great book. I'm going to put it, I'm going to adapt it into a screenplay and retain as much of it as possible because I loved everything in it. Uh, so that process was so great because it's like, okay, I can write and showing it to him and be like, what do you think? And he's like, well, this is... This is great. This is my book, but it's a screenplay, and and that was the start. Um, and I had adapted several of his Pig Blood Blues and Damnation Game, and the one that got made was Dread, which was a it was Clive's only psychological thriller. He had at the time he had not done anything without supernatural content or monsters, but Dread was a psychological thriller. And that I was really drawn to that because it was also about people that were close to my age and being in college. And why are you telling horror stories? Why not uh, action hero or some, you know, complicated romance? I like to scare people, and I love horror. But I, but truth be told, I don't write a lot of horror. You know, I, I it, having been a writer for many, many years, I started writing in children's fantasy adventures and stuff. So a lot of the stuff that I write outside of what I direct is not, isn't horror at all. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's romance and sci-fi and action adventure. And Natalie and I do a lot of that. So I, I direct horror films because I've always been that guy growing up that loves Halloween and like loves special makeup effects. Because that's what got me into pursuing horror was special makeup effects. I love dealing with creating monsters and things like that. But I just get a joy out of creeping people out. <laughs> you know, even if it's with friends and I can hide in a closet, I'll do it. Well, you said your dad would take you to the cinema? Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad is a, a big cinephile. And he grew up... He is from an older generation. He had me much later in life, a much younger mother than father. They were 20 years apart. So he saw Frankenstein when it came out. My, my dad was born in 1930. And so I came up with the Universal Monsters, and, and he loved, you know, he still loves monster movies and things like that. So that was infused in my being very early on. I was also watching you know, like Once Upon a Time in America at like six years old or like five, you know, like, so I was seeing movies and I'm like, do I know what's going on? But I was watching those movies at an early age. You know, my, my parents were never like policing their viewing, right? They weren't like, oh, you can't watch this because it has adult themes or anything. I, I was just exposed to a lot as a kid. So I, I still that all, all kind of made me who I am, like watching these these epics at an early age. 